So I'll uh, give you a quick intro of myself before I get into the topic. So um, I'm a lead product manager at Best Buy. I uh, lead the entire uh, multi-channel uh, thread. Uh, that's basically uh, solving problems for customers in the stores uh, using the mobile app. How do I deliver value for them? So things I look after is inventory, uh, product scanning, uh, in-store product comparison, in-store pickup, uh, all that kind of stuff, last product fulfillment, those kind of things. And uh, I've been a product manager for about eight years. Uh, I was a developer before that. I worked for Home Depot. I worked for Bed Bath & Beyond, finally uh, Best Buy. And uh, th uh, throughout my career, I've seen that uh, product managers are generally leaders, but nobody reports to them, right? It's only after the first six or seven years of my career that I actually had direct reports. And I mean, six or seven years of being a product manager. I was an individual contributor for a very long time. Yet, you are a leader and you lead hundreds of people. So it sounds a little funny, right? Like how do you lead so many people without anyone, without managing their growth, without managing their, uh, I mean, uh, payroll or anything, but you still give direction and people actually listen to you. So uh, I want to talk a little bit about that today. Uh, also about today's presentation, I didn't get any of the material from any of the books or slides or anything. I, did, I just uh, made, a, made up everything. So. My slides may not look too great, but you have my charm, so you, can, you have that to take away. So, cool. So how to influence without authority, right? Uh, yeah, like I said, my charm is the biggest takeaway, right? But the three things that I would uh, uh, want you to take away from here is, number one, influence is the key to product success. We'll talk about that, why influence is the key, uh, why influence is so important, why companies think they're important, right? Number two, uh, Different skills are required for influencing different people. We'll talk about uh, different circles of influence. You have your direct circle, you have a middle circle, you have an extended circle. How do you influence different people? What are the different skills that we need? And finally, okay, shared ob objectives across an org are key for disruptive products, right? These are all related to influence. So uh, we'll, we'll have some time for questions in the end. But to get started, right? Uh, let's reintroduce uh, what a product manager typically does. What are the skills required of a product manager, right? So number one, a product manager comes up with a vision, right? A vision for, an, uh, for a product, solving a problem. Uh, the, my vision for using the Best Buy app inside of a store is blue shirt in your hand. So when you have the app inside of a store and you're moving around, it's as good as having an associate in your hand. That's my vision, so that's, that's, that's what a product manager does. A product manager also works on customer development. You have a target customer, you define who the customer is. You do that. Uh, you also set some goals and with goals come success metrics. You, def you prioritize which goal is important, uh, what over the other, right? And you execute, you work with engineering, UX, and you execute your ideas. You also market your feature in the industry. You make sure that you get more and more users to actually use your features. And finally, uh, you monitor success, right? But this uh, meeting is not about a product manager skills. We are talking specifically about influence. But these are the core skills, yet a product manager faces a lot of challenges, right? Number one, sorry, right? Uh, too little time. You are required, uh, like at any point of time, my calendar is triple booked, right? You're required at three places at one point of time because you have multiple lines of product running depending on, the, depending on what portfolio you're in. Somewhere there is a vision conversation, somewhere there's a developer who wants help, someone there's marketing who wants help. So you have very little time. So priority is a huge concern. You don't have any authority. Like you have, like the, the company expects you to do magic, right? But nobody reports to you. That's, that's the biggest truth, right? Uh, there were days when the big bosses, the GMs would decide what to do. That would trickle down to program managers or project managers, and program managers would take action. But the product manager role has changed everything. Most of the decisions happen bottom up. The product manager decides who the customer is, they decide what to do, and the uh, leadership only sets the company vision, right? So that's how it's changed. But how are you supposed to do that when you don't have people reporting into you, right? Uh, sometimes your team is not motivated, you have people quitting all the time. Now you don't, uh, you don't, uh, you're not their boss, but then you're expected to motivate the team, right? And not ha having an unmotivated team is a huge challenge. You have external dependencies on which you have no control, APIs, vendors. Uh, even though you're supposed to work on the customer, people say work 99% of your time on the customer, but you have all these other things which pull you down and unknown situations, there can be anything. But the biggest one is organization bureaucracy, right? 
that is the biggest challenge that a product manager faces. Uh, typically, I'll give you my example, right? Like I work in Best Buy, which is one of the largest uh, consumer, it is the largest consumer electronics retailer in the world. I work with stakeholders who've been with the company for 30 years, and for them, a product is a washing machine or refrigerator. An app is not a product, right? So, uh, and uh, there are people who, whose objectives are different, and uh, there's a lot of bureaucracy. There's a lot of approvals required at every stage. There's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, red tape. So that's what a product manager has to navigate. And because of that, these are some skills that are super important but are often overlooked. This is, this is one of the things that you don't see in job description too much, but this is super important. Public speaking, right? Being able to talk to a large crowd, being able to be confident, talking to unfamiliar audiences, just making trips, just to have conversations, right? That is something a product manager is required to do, but often overlooked. Number two, documentation. Uh, writing white papers, writing thought papers, writing press releases, that's something a product manager has to do, but nobody talks about them, right? Like these, these are things you discover on the job, right? Uh, motivating people, right? You have to be a motivator. You cannot be working in a silo, not talking to anyone, making people upset. Like you have to motivate the team. You rally a team around you. And finally, influencing. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. So why is influencing, what is influencing, briefly, right? So the art of getting others to believe in what you believe in, right? And getting support from them, that's what influence is. Making other people support your cause, that's what influence is, right? And we'll talk about how influencing is different from convincing and why it's so important in, a, uh, in the context of a product, right? Why is influencing important, right? So this is something, this is a, a very basic diagram, but very true, and this is something I've seen uh, a lot of times I've, I've had a lot of product friends who've had brilliant original ideas, right? Like uh, something like sending people to Mars, right? That's an, that's an orig original brilliant idea, right? But then you go through an organization's bureaucracy, right? Like at every layer, your uh, challenge becomes harder, right? You deal with someone, you deal with a manager, then you deal with a the director, then you deal with a VP. If you're in an organization where titles are big, that's a huge problem, right? You need to get approvals from people, you need to uh, convince people, and finally, what you get is, an, is a very, very small outcome, right? Like, you wanted to send someone to, the Mar someone to Mars, but you can't send someone to the restaurant next door. So that's what actually happens. Uh, a lot of big, brilliant ideas get shot down even before they reach, uh, I mean, a consensus stage. Like, they, they get shot down, stripped down. What you normally get is only 5% of what you originally thought through. So. Uh, most of the companies want PM to be influencers, right? So I picked up, I went to LinkedIn and I looked at uh, the top three job descriptions of three of the biggest companies like Amazon, Microsoft, Google. They hire the most product managers. Each of them, like almost every single job description has this thing listed. We need someone who is an influencer, right? And even when you go for interviews, you're asked these questions in different shapes and forms. Uh, tell me about a time when you've uh, actually had to get the consensus of a group to get something done. Tell me about a time when you had to deal with a difficult stakeholder. These are all about influences. And that's something that and right now, I've seen in the last few years, uh, these companies are openly mentioning that in their job descriptions, in, in what they want from people, right? So uh, we'll jump straight away into the topic about influence. Uh, the product manager works with a lot of people, right? And there are different circles of influence. And uh, this, is, this is a very practical approach to the way I look at circle of influence. So the first thing is your inner circle of influence, right? You have, uh, the, you work with a, an agile team. You work with some developers. You work with some UX people. You work with some quality assurance people, some testers. You also sometimes have a product leader, like a lead product manager or a director who's directly above your team. In most tech companies, this is called a squad. You are given ownership of a specific problem to solve and you're supposed to solve that problem. So that's the inner circle. Again, no one reports to you, but you have somewhat authority. You have some kind of authority because the devs are gonna work on user stories that you write. The UX is gonna start solving problems that you define. So you have somewhat an, an influence. But even, even though they all report to the respective people, then you have the middle circle of influence that involves other product managers, shared services. Like if I want to, if I want to show inventory in, in a mobile app or, mobile, uh, or a mobile website, I, the shared service could be the inventory service that gets store inventory for me, right? So there are ratings and reviews could be a shared service. So 
Uh, there are other product managers from other organizations who form the middle circle. There's heavy dependency on them because while you define um, customer uh, problems and customer solutions, they give you the data, they give you the tools for you for, for that to happen, right? And finally, there is the outer circle. Uh, like if you've played Super Mario, uh, Super Mario, have you, have you guys played Mario, the Nintendo game? They're, these guys are the dragons, right? So they actually pull down everything because uh, it's very, very hard to influence them. Uh, they are finance, marketing, operations, customer service, and the problem is all of them have completely different objectives. Uh, most product managers think their problem is the biggest. It's great, great to be passionate, but for them, their agenda is completely different, right? So that's how it is. So uh, I'm going to talk about influence based on a scenario, right? I'm going to create a hypothetical scenario. I, try, I thought very hard. I wanted to give you a real case study of how well, I've solved something like that, but uh, this is very similar to a real case study. Let's talk about a hypothetical scenario. Let's say Amy is a product manager and uh, she works for an e-commerce company, an apparel company, right? Uh, they, they sell apparels. And uh, she is the product manager of the mobile app, the shopping experience, a very small portion of a very large business. And uh, her objective given to her by management is sell more, right? Let's say it's very common. It's a very common profile in any large e-commerce company, Amazon, even Microsoft on the retail side, this is something that you always have. Now, Amy, Amy, she crafts an idea. She thinks of a problem and she crafts an idea. And this is the way she crafts it. She defines a problem. That's what a product manager does. She says, middle class working parents find it hard to keep buying clothes for their growing kids, right? Um, abstract, but yeah, it's a problem, right? Market size, there are about 100 million such families in the US. Solution, she wants to create an, a membership, an order subscription service, where if someone paid pay $20 a year, they would get 40% off on anything they bought, right? A subscription service. Uh, and with that, she wanted to mitigate the problem of parents wanting to buy clothes for their kids, right? Middle class parents. And she uh, estimates that in the first year, she's going to lose $2 million. But in three years, she's going to gain $20 million, right? This is something a product manager, it's an everyday thing. People do this all the time. You think of ideas. You do five or six of this anytime, right? So this is something she does. Now she depends, uh, she wants to influence her inner circle, right? She, she, so she gives them the task. She tells them, let's build a subscription service, right? Let's start building it. Uh, engineers start looking at services, UX, start building the UX and all that stuff. But then there are issues, right? First one, the team thinks it's too complicated, right? They don't understand why they're being asked to do something over what they're already doing. Uh, the UX does not believe this is an innovation. Like, uh, this is a classic thing between product and UX, right? UX think they own the product, product think they also own the product, right? But they, both of them own the customer. The, the product belongs to the customer, right? So conflict, right? How do, you, how do you deal with the situation? And this is only the inner circle. It's a very common situation. If you have a smart UX person working in your team, they want to be involved. They, do, they don't want to be told what to do, right? Now, uh, he reaches to his, he reaches to, uh, his uh, peers who are product managers in different teams. He wants to figure out what the dependency is with other product managers. She figures out that she needs something on the home page, a home page entry point. She needs to create a new browse experience. She wants to create a new way for subscription, right? She wants to influence the checkout PM so that the checkout PM, the, the mobile checkout PM can create a subscription experience for her. And she wants to talk to the fulfillment product manager who is going to uh, basically create the ability to fulfill orders on a periodic basis. So it's all tasks that different product managers have to do. But she has roadblocks on those places as well. Uh, common things you get from other product managers when you, got, when you want them to do your stuff, they already have something on their roadmap okay, that has a higher ROI. Uh, ROI is return on investment, right? So they have something that's, that, that they believe is going to give them higher ROI. Their boss thinks this is, not something, this is not something that's very important and they need to prioritize this over something else. Uh, finally, we need to build new services and I don't have the resources, right? So in short, they don't think it's important. They don't give a damn, right? Basically, uh, you've given them a task and it's fallen flat. But, and this is where most product gets killed. And this is not even the hardest circle, right? So what are the different issues here? Let's try to figure it out. 
Number one is we didn't make the team, like when you talk about the inner circle, it's super important that we make them believe in the cause, right? And influence starts right there, right? You make them believe in the cause, in the problem you're trying to solve, not on the solution. Don't give them a solution that I want to build a subscription service. Make them feel the problem, make them emotional, right? So uh, we didn't show them who the customer is, number one. We didn't involve the inner circle in any kind of research, right? We didn't give them a chance to provide any ideas, right? So they feel very left out. They feel passed over. You've just given us a task. That was the number one issue when we spoke about the inner circle, right? Issue two, being too solution focused, right? We, uh, we uh, directly came, she directly came up with a subscription service, whereas she should have spoken more about the problem, which is the problem that the uh, that parents are facing. What, are, what, is the, what is the real problem that middle class Americans are facing? Is it, is it money? Is it uh, status? Is it uh, lack of time? Are they working parents? She didn't talk about the problem. So basically, solution creates opinions. Everybody's gonna have an opinion about a solution. Like this is not cool, uh, the scar's not great, but problems create emotion, right? When you, when you tell people that, um, I mean, Americans, are, middle class Americans cannot afford something, right? then it creates emotion, it, it binds a lot of people together. So that is that was number one, and the other thing. And issue three is convincing someone on something they don't believe in. Like you give them a task and then try to convince them. So con convincing and influence is kind of different, right? Convincing is basically when you and I have different goals. And for example, say uh, I wanted to have coffee and uh, you wanted to have soda, right? And I try to convince you to have coffee. That's not going to work, right? Because in your mind, you already have decided that you want soda. But influencing is when I try to change your objective, right? Shared goals. Let's try to have a good time. Let's try to have a conversation, right? That's where it starts. So convincing and influencing. Convincing is about trying to change your goal. Influencing is about sharing a goal, right? Uh, convincing is basically when you want an output from someone and we just want someone to do something for us. It's like very mathematical, very transactional. And influencing is when you want an outcome from someone. So we, I want to be successful, I need your help to be successful, right? Uh, influ convincing is all about tasks, influencing is about goals, we spoke about that. And convincing is you're trying to be a hero. You wanna, you wanna take all the credit by getting the input from everyone. Influencing is you're the leader, right? But you want everyone to be successful. So let's put this into a little bit of perspective, right? So when you wanna convince someone, here are a couple of questions that I would ask myself and I would run through every single person. Uh, what's the problem I want to solve? Like, the pro what's the, what is exactly the problem I want to solve? Uh, do I know the other person's goal, right? Will solving my problem also address their goal, right? For example, in my case, my goal is to create money, cre uh, satisfy customers with a subs subscription service, but the fulfillment product manager's goal is to uh, deliver more packages every single hour, right? And deliver it efficiently. They're completely different, right? How do I now influence their goal, right? Now, is my goal more important for them? Is basically creating more uh, influence, I mean, making more parents happy, is it more important than delivering more packages, right? Can I get part of their goal into my goal as well? Can I say that I want to make these parents happy and I also want to make sure that this fulfillment reaches a 99% satisfaction level, right? So can we share our goals in some way? Can we marry them in, some, in, in a certain way, okay? Like, can I tweak my goal to also impact their KPIs? Do I promise, do I promise to share my success with them? Uh, this is another thing, like many product managers are very uh, concerned about losing credit for success of the product. The unsaid rule is if the product is successful, the, you know, the product manager is always successful. It doesn't matter who gets the credit. The product manager always gets the credit, right? So the more the merrier. Like if you can share your success with more people, it's always good. It's like everyone should be part of it. Then then, then the impact can be much higher, right? Will they have a stake on this with me? Like someone will, is willing, will be willing to do something for you only if they have a stake in it, only if they make an investment, only if they, uh, like in, in my world, what I do is we, uh, we, follow this, we, we follow the principle of objectives and key results. Uh, and I try to tell my I try to tell my peers here's the problem I'm trying to solve. I'm going to put this down in my appraisal sheet, my goal sheet. I want you to put this in your goal sheet, and then that person has a stake in that, right? And that's how we, then both of us have to make it successful. Both of us have to make it happen to make it successful. It's it's not solution oriented, but it's objective oriented, right? 
And will they feel passionate about my problem? They'll only do something for you if they feel passionate about your problem, right? So these are a couple, these are a couple of questions I would ask every single influence, every single person I want to influence before trying to uh, put my goal, before, before trying to put my goal forward, right? So here's how I would restate the problem, right? Uh, I'll take you, give you a minute to read it, but essentially, I want middle class Americans never to worry about being able to afford clothes for their growing kids. I have evidence that 25% of American middle class families can't buy new clothes for their kids every year and kids are forced to wear non-fitting clothes to their schools. I really need your help to solve this problem. Will you be my partner to do this and solve this? It could bring a lot of smiles to the kids and the company could make 10 million in three years. I'd love to hear about how you would help us solve this problem. I have this idea, but want to understand your perspective, right? So it's basically drafting it in a way that you're making other people partners, you're, make, you're influencing them, you're making them stakeholders, you're making them uh, put something, uh, you're making them put a bet in the problem you're trying to solve. So that is something, the way I, I would influence my immediate inner circle and the middle circle, right? But when you reach out to the outer circle, right, the issues are much more complicated, they are magnified, right? So, no. For example, operations, legal, and uh, stakeholders, they have completely different goals. Operations would say, right, this needs a new process, right? I don't really, more, of, more often than not, operations are not worried about customers. They are worried about efficiency, right? This requires a new process. You, I need to get VP approval, right? Uh, you cannot auto sell, and the legal could say, you cannot auto sell any kind of fabric. There are some federal rules, we have to respect them. So we cannot do this, right? Uh, category managers, specifically in retail companies, are never willing to give away a share of conversion. Like uh, this, is, this is a very common, this is a com common thing, short term versus long term. Short term loss versus long term gain. People are not willing to see that, right? So how do you convince these people who are very difficult to convince, right? So one of the thing I do is gauge their interest very early, right? You try to restate the problem to them over and over again, way before you're actually trying to uh, present an entire business case, right? You just try to say, and what, the, what I do is basically repeat, repeat, repeat over and over again, go for informal lunches, happy hours, at a ping pong table, wherever. Like try to meet these people and try to plant your idea in their head before you actually make a formal customer or business presentation. That is something uh, I think is uh, super important. Like before I wanted to launch, I, I recently launched an app for Best Buy employees to be used in the store. And uh, before, and there was a lot of opposition from operations because they didn't want store associates to be holding a mobile device when they should be talking to a customer, right? Their whole goal was getting more out of an employee every hour. My goal was to help customers. And by empowering employees, I could help customers better. In order to get that done, I made a trip to Minnesota where the operations team is. I made a trip there 11 months before I actually started the product, right? And I made a trip again nine months uh, before. Then I made a trip again seven months before. Then on the day, right? And every single time I would go and play ping pong with every single person, right? Try to influence them, try to, try to just plant this idea. Hey, here's this idea, what do you think? At first they would dismiss it. But when they hear it over and over again, they're so bored they have to say yes, right? So that's what ultimately happens. So keep repeating the same stuff over and over again. Even if they are against it, they are, fam they are familiar, right? And when someone's familiar with something, it's uh, influence and becomes a little easier, right? But obviously, it's nowhere close to the end, right? Uh, strong customer and business documentation. A lot of companies follow this policy, right? So basically, press releases, white papers, projections, all these kind of things. Uh, one of the things I've seen here is in a company like Amazon, right, where the whole company follows the same procedure, the press release of the white paper works. In a lot of companies, it doesn't work, right? So creating different kind of material for different audiences is super important. Some people like two slider decks, some people want to dive deep. So understanding the context of the audience and preparing material for them that makes them confident that you know what you're talking about. Your research has to be foolproof, your business case has to be really strong and different material for different kinds of audiences, super important, right? Uh, and, uh, and also getting stakeholders to contribute to your document. You can even share a document that is 30% done, but get inputs from them to actually build the case along with your stakeholders, along with the people you want to influence. Let them be partners and then it becomes a much stronger case, right? Uh, let others champion your cause. For example, like here, let's say Amy wanted the uh, product manager of operations 
to help her with setting up the operations for this whole initiative, the product manager of operations op uh, reports to the VP of operations. There's no way she's thinking she can get this done this year because the product manager of operations has a full roadmap. There's no way that person is going to accommodate that. So the way you can do that is, but, but she has a very good relationship with the product manager of fulfillment, right? Uh, because they probably work on the same team, they've been from the same school, call it, who knows, but she has a very good relationship. So if the product manager of fulfillment and Amy have the same shared goal, the product manager of fulfillment can actually play the role of influencing, right? So you can actually have allies in different organization who can play your role, right? And that's going back to the same thing, because you're the product manager, it doesn't mean you have to be in every single product meeting, it doesn't mean you have to talk to every single person who wants to know about the product, letting others champion your cause actually makes your product stronger, right? Like there have been many product demonstrations for where I'm, I haven't been, I've let uh, developers demo my uh, product to vice presidents, like the lack of attention, yeah, to a certain extent it's important, but more than anything, to influence, you need to let other people take center stage, right? Let them feel important, let them do the convincing for you. For you, the objective is the product should be successful. It's not you, it's not about you, it's about the product and about the customer, right? So letting other people champion the cause is super important. So shared, so once we do all this, we have most of these people we've spoken about, they can have shared objectives and key results, right? So if everyone had the same objective and the objective was basically to, uh, help parents uh, afford clothes for their kids through this new subscription program and if everyone had the same key result, uh, the same metric that they were working against, which is add say 20 million new customers, generate 10 million in three years and lose 2 million in the first year, then it becomes a lot easier. Then you've influenced everyone, you influence everyone to create a disruptive product, right? Uh, that's, but to reach the stage, it's a very, very long process, it involves Influence the, influencing the inner circle, then the middle circle, and then finally the external circle, right? So that becomes a shared obsession, right? So the learnings I would communicate here is influencing again is the key to product success. Understanding the inner and outer circles and influence in different ways depending on the situations, right? Shared objectives is equal to shared obsession. So these are the three key learnings that I would uh, hope that we get from this session. And that's it. Thank you.